These are powerful prophetic words from Abraham's lips. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. The two of them went together to God's particular chosen holy destination. The son at this point clearly a willing participant. He's really about to kill his own son. God sets up this binding of Isaac to prefigure the coming greatest sacrifice in human history. God never intended for Abraham to sacrifice his son. He always planned for the ram substitute for Isaac. God has a plan of escape for humanity. As Isaac carried the heavy burden of the wood upon his back, so did Jesus carry his heavy wooden cross. Jehovah Jireh provided a substitute in place of Isaac, but there was no substitute for Jesus. God did indeed provide for himself the lamb. Abraham's absolute obedience enables the perfect foreshadowing of Christ. In our last study, we heard God instruct Abraham to go to a certain hill outside of Jerusalem and sacrifice your only begotten son, Isaac. We left off with Isaac and Abraham beginning their ascent of the chosen hill in the Moriah region, the wood on Isaac's back, the knife in Abraham's hand. Let's pick up from verse 7 of Genesis chapter 22. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Maybe Isaac assumed they'd purchase a lamb when they arrived at Salem. Or perhaps he'd considered his father had plans to sacrifice the donkey. It's only now that the donkey had been left behind and they weren't walking up towards the city of Salem. It's only at this point that Isaac understandably questions his father. The fact that Isaac hadn't questioned his father about these details until this point strongly indicates the trust, confidence and respect Isaac had for his father. Likely Isaac recognised the directing hand of God in Abraham's life. Abraham seemed to have the metaphorical Midas touch. Everything in Abraham's life seemed to work out. Isaac had learned from his experience to trust fully in his father. A great model for us. We need to have total confidence in our heavenly father and his will for our life. Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. These are powerful prophetic words from Abraham's lips. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Abraham's faith in God is rock solid and Isaac's faith in his father is rock solid. Abraham never protested to God and Isaac never protested to his father. Isaac did understandably ask for explanation. I'm carrying this heavy load, but we have no animal to sacrifice. But not even the slightest hesitation is hinted at in the actions and words of the father and the son, both determined in purpose, faithfully trusting the plans and purposes of God. The two of them went together to God's particular chosen, holy destination, a hilltop just outside the city of Jerusalem, a place where Abraham fully expected God to work an amazing miracle. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. The Holy Spirit has been repetitively specific about this sacrifice needing to take place in a very particular location upon a preordained hill. By my count, six times this God-chosen place is mentioned in the text. In verse 14, a final time, the nominated location will be mentioned, taking the count to seven times. And after the seventh time, this special chosen place will be named. When the Holy Spirit focuses on some seemingly minor detail like this, observant students of Scripture should recognise the apparently minor is truly a major. A greater truth is hidden in the details. This is your marker sign 
to dig to discover the hidden mystery. Abraham arranges the altar, likely a rocky base rectangular platform, with the wood neatly placed in order on top of the altar. Then without discussion or any hint of resistance or objection from Isaac, Abraham binds his son. Isaac willingly allows this to occur. There is simply no chance his father could have bound him against Isaac's will. Not so much as a peep from Isaac. He opens not his mouth. Then Abraham laid his son on the altar. The son at this point clearly a willing participant. He could easily have wriggled out from the platform even at this point. But without a fight, without protest, he displays total trust in his father's otherwise bewildering actions. Verse 10. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. At this dramatic moment in history, Abraham truly demonstrates his unquestioning faith in God. He's really about to kill his own son, fully anticipating that God will have to raise his son from death. And the depth of Abraham's faith is revealed to Abraham himself. You see, God knows what each of us are capable of doing. He knows where our limitations are. He knows our strengths and weaknesses. He can add titanium to our strengths and build fortresses to buttress our weaknesses. God orders these events to demonstrate to Abraham the extent of his own personal faith. He orchestrates this drama to demonstrate to all humanity what true faith in God looks like. God sets up this binding of Isaac, the Akedah, to prefigure the coming greatest sacrifice in human history. We'll look into this at the conclusion of our study. This is now the third time in this account where Abraham has responded, Here I am. The angel of the Lord, otherwise known to us as Jesus, double barrel shouts Abraham's name from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Whatever you command, Lord, I'll do it. This is such a familiar passage to most of us. But have you ever truly considered how genuinely available you are to the will of God in your life? What would you be willing to give up for Jesus? Or a more important question, what would you be willing to do for Jesus? And an even more critical question, what are you doing for Jesus? Verse 12, and he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Moses has a particular frequent style of writing anthropocentrically. That's a fancy way of saying Moses often expresses history from a man-centred perspective. Omniscient God already knew Abraham's faith had matured to the point where he'd now obey God no matter the cost. I believe Abraham would have failed this test of faith if given earlier in his life. God used the tough experiences of Abraham's life to mould and shape him into the man God needed him to be. Likewise, God allows each of us to go through tough and tricky circumstances. He allows us to suffer loss, to endure through trials and tribulations, to build our character, to add wisdom and discernment. The tougher the circumstances you find yourself in, the tighter you need to cling to Jesus. You can choose to allow the dramas of this short life to break you or allow God to grow and sustain you through them. God can bring greatness from the traumatic, beauty from the ugly, success from loss, good from bad. Understand, light has its most dramatic effect in the darkest of dark. Verse 13. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place 
The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. How wonderful our God is, our Lord, our provider, Jehovah Jireh. God never intended for Abraham to sacrifice his son. He always planned for the ram substitute for Isaac. God has a plan of escape for humanity. Almighty God has only one means of salvation and deliverance for man. You'll find no redemption in religion, no peace in pleasure, no worth in wealth, no atonement in altruism, no future in fame, no lasting fulfilment in family, no salvation in success. Good deeds won't get you out of hell and into heaven. It's only Jehovah Jireh who can provide. This is the first time this name for God is used in the Bible. The Almighty Provider, in a shocking demonstration of his love for us, proving comprehensively his ability to provide for humanity. God the Father sent his only begotten and greatly loved Son to Jerusalem, prefigured wonderfully by Isaac, the only begotten and greatly loved Son of Father Abraham. Isaac had absolute confidence in his Abba, just as Jesus trusted fully in the will of his Abba, both fathers and sons in perfect union. As Isaac carried the heavy burden of the wood upon his back, so did Jesus carry his heavy wooden cross. As Isaac didn't argue or protest over his fate, so Jesus, as a sheep before its shearer is silent, opened not his mouth. As Isaac questioned his father, so Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As God led Isaac to a particular hilltop in the Moriah region just outside the city of Salem, so Jesus was led to Golgotha, I suspect, the very same hilltop just outside of Jerusalem. Jehovah Jireh provided a substitute in place of Isaac, but there was no substitute for Jesus. God did indeed provide for himself the lamb. The declaration made by Abraham back in verse 7 is a declaration of prophecy that roars across space and time. The provider, Jehovah Jireh, did provide himself the lamb. Not a lamb, not a ram, but the lamb. The lamb of God who was sacrificed on a certain hilltop just outside Jerusalem to provide a way of salvation for all humanity. The Lamb declared when living on earth, Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You might also recall in this narrative they had a three-day journey to Moriah. During the three days' journey, Isaac was as good as dead in the eyes of Abraham, being restored to his father on the third day. And Jesus literally died and rose on the third day, returning to the father in fulfilment of this Genesis 22 foreshadowing. Can you even conceive of the love of God for us? that he'd allow his perfect and pure son to suffer and die for wicked sinners like us. Can you begin to imagine the love of the son willing to endure such suffering for me and you? How can anyone not entrust their lives to Jesus? Your faith placed in him will see deliverance from death as Abraham experienced. Why would you live for anything else but to serve Jesus Jehovah Jireh, mankind's wonderful provider, the Lamb of God, the Son of the living God, victorious over the grave on the third day, promising eternal life to all who place their faith and trust in him. Verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. 
Abraham would go on to live for several more decades after this incredible prophetic three days. But this chapter marks the pinnacle moment in his life. All Abraham's failings, his faithlessness, his faults, his stumblings, all now behind him. Lessons learned from each time of trauma. Only now, at roughly 130 years of age, is Abraham ready to hear from God and obey him without question, without hesitation, walking in beautiful faithfulness. In this chapter, we witness the awesome power of God working in the events of Abraham's life to bring about an incredible prefiguring and foreshadowing of the ultimate plan of God's redemption for man. These events taking place about 2,100 years before Jesus went to Calvary. Jehovah Jireh reveals more of the fine print of the Abrahamic covenant. I'm not sure why most of Christianity doesn't understand this, but God is 100% bound to upholding this Abrahamic covenant. Not because Abraham's line of promise the Jews deserve the blessings of God. God must continue to uphold this Abrahamic covenant to the descendants of Abraham because he promised to do so. God made this promise due to Abraham's obedience, even in extreme circumstances, as his faith triumphed over death. God is on a bound to continue preserving the Jews and sustaining the Jews from their enemies. God is bound to this covenant because of the events culminating in Genesis 22. Note, this is very important, An unconditional covenant may have conditional blessings. A multiplication of Abraham's descendants is again affirmed and promised by God. Plus, we have a promise of Israel possessing the gate of their enemies. Now, this doesn't mean Israel will always defeat their enemies. Many a generation of Israel has been judged and suffered near unbearable oppression at the hands of their enemies. God many times has judged the nation Israel, but God has always preserved the Jews through their times of judgment, and he must continue to preserve them until he's ready to see Israel elevated to their place of destiny, just as God preserved Abraham through his long, faltering journey of faith till the day Abraham was ready. Israel's place of honour among the nations, their place of victory and security against their enemies, is for a future blessed day. Israel will only finally find this place of rest and blessing in the millennial kingdom on earth after the second coming. Verse 18. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba or Beersheba. In Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This seed is not speaking of the nation Israel. It references the greatest of Abraham's descendants, Yeshua, the Messiah of mankind, born from the line of Isaac. In this chapter, God directs Abraham to play out the dramatic events of the coming Redeemer. Abraham's absolute obedience enables the perfect foreshadowing of Christ. And because of Abraham's obedience and faith, Abraham is given God's coded promise, the Redeemer will come from your son Isaac. The only begotten of the Heavenly Father will come from the only begotten son of Abraham. Abraham, the earthly forefather of we people of faith in Christ today. We Gentile believers have been adopted into the family of God. The New Testament describes us as wild olive branches grafted in. But never be so arrogant, so opposing the plans and purposes of God to assume we've replaced the natural branches. Once the church is raptured, God will again turn his attention to the redemption of Israel, the natural branches, and their final seven rebellious years of Daniel 9 angelic prophetic history will cataclysmically play out. In a day Jeremiah called the time of Jacob's trouble, In a day, Jesus and Daniel declared the time of history's greatest trouble and tribulation, a time culminating with the second coming, leading to 1,000 years of hope fulfilled, extending into an eternity of blessings. 
This is the future predicted in the Bible for Abraham's chosen nation of promise. It's fitting Abraham retires to the well of seven, a number symbolizing completion. This well of seven or this well of the oath, symbolic of the fulfillment of God's covenant to Abraham and his earthly descendants Israel. I'll leave you to read the final few verses where we glimpse the future wife of Isaac. Until our next study, may Jehovah Jireh richly provide for you all.